Welcome to EO 164 online version. Well, my name is Patrick Van Otteren, as you may already know. Uh, we're going to be going through, starting out with chapter one here about the programmable logic controllers. Uh, today we are going to actually be reviewing three separate chapters, chapter one, chapter two, and chapter four. So starting out with chapter one, we're looking at uh, uh, basically a basic overview, or as the chapter one is called, an N overview of, of a PLC or a programmable logic controller. So essentially a programmable logic controller or PLC, an overview. Okay, section 1.1 of chapter one. Here we are looking at the most widely used industrial process control technology. Uh, what that means for us is that uh, when you're uh, dealing, when you're working in industry, uh, what you will find is this device is going to operate and maintain uh, the system's operations. So uh, there's this device that. Uh, is going to read a series of inputs and develop a series of output turning turning outputs on and off uh, to to uh, operate the machine and uh, continue with machine processes. Uh, the design behind the PLC is such that it uh, uh, it is something that is maintained. Uh, the format is maintained for for multiple years. Uh, so, uh, what that means for us in industry is that, uh, as everyone knows, when you buy a PC, for instance, you walk out the store, the PCs are already outdated. Uh, what the manufacturer of the PLCs states is they'll give you a minimum of five years of operation as is. There may be some upgrades and updates along the way, and then after the five years are up, they will still support the uh, hardware and usually they'll make um, new new hardware that is compatible with this existing technology for another five years on top of that. So it's, usually you end up with about a, uh, a, a new platform is good for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. I mean, I, there's some older PLCs, uh, slick 500s that we will see here in this uh, in this manual that uh, describes uh, equipment that's over 30 years old that's still being used today. So here we are looking at a, a micro PLC, uh, very uh, very common. This list is what they call a micro is because it's got all our, our fixed I/O. So uh, what that means is there's not slots. If you looked at the previous screen, you could see multiple slots of PLC here. As you can see, this is one block of, of PLC and inputs and outputs. The uh, I1 through I8 would be the inputs, and that Q1 through Q8 would be the outputs. To the right here, you'll see a picture of a relay. Again, you'll see uh, some of the aspects of uh, PLC versus a relay. But noticing here on the left, uh, all the wires, all the little relays, all these connections, all these possibilities for, for problems. If you look over here on the right, this is much cleaner. You see uh, the same number of inputs and outputs being controlled, but here they're being controlled by a PLC, which is a straight point-to-point -point wiring. So that means what that means is a wire comes from the input point right to a terminal or to, to the input device and the output wires directly to the output. Here you're going to have a device that comes into uh, uh, an input on a relay for instance and the output of that goes to another relay and the output of that goes to another relay and, and multiple points of, of connectivity, connectivity and, and that, that creates for difficulty in troubleshooting and difficulty in building. A lot of challenges there. So another point that they want to make is a uh, the PLC is uh, considered to be reliable. Why? Because there's not really any moving parts. That's um, that's how the PLC is kind of designed. It's designed uh, to, to minimize moving parts. So what they do is they take a, a chip in the uh, and uh, reads all the uh, information from the PLC 
makes decisions, and then turns on the associated outputs. Now, so there is, I'm going to say, um, mostly no moving parts. They uh, quite often will put a relay output on the output of a PLC, uh, which does actually have some moving component to it, but that only allows it to run a little more current through it. That's why they do the relay outputs. Again, we get more flexibility. Now, if you can imagine if you had to make a change in that uh, relay sequence of wiring, uh, that, that required a, a, a little bit of energy. Uh, some, some definitely put a, have to put some serious thought into where you'd have to move a, relay, a wire from one relay to another. Be a lot, a lot of challenge there. Here, you're able to go in. If you needed to um, modify an operation, it would be a, a matter of just changing the way these uh, these uh, pro the program is configured. Again, looking at the uh, the relay operation, uh, uh, you, if you put in the time to figure out how to wire this, uh, troubleshoot it, and uh, develop it, you'll find that the, the cost of this is going to way exceed the cost of a PLC. One huge aspect that's really come alive in the last 10 years in a PLC is the communications capabilities. As you can see here, this picture shows us down a, a PLC uh, talking on a local area network. Uh, this is connected to uh, multiple PCs, uh, usually some sort of uh, uh, main network of a, of a, of a company or uh, even a, uh, on a worldwide basis. So you can, uh, you can be talking to, to PCs and PLCs over uh, over continents. Uh, I have experience with that myself, where we were troubleshooting um, uh, equipment in China while we were here in the states. So uh, it is uh, it's very doable. Um, you can watch the process uh, take place, the programming, uh, how it is being resolved from here in the states. That's it's a pretty cool operation. Um, one of the, uh, the points they're bringing up here is that we have a uh, faster response time. So with the, the PLCs getting better and better, they're able to uh, to, to pick up uh, more information. Uh, we're able to see more signals coming in and out of the, the PLC. Uh, still, there's there's some challenges with this, but uh, but definitely with the newer technology, we have seen huge improvements in this area. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they are way easier to troubleshoot. When it comes to troubleshooting a PLC, uh, as opposed to a series of relays, you get to pull out the laptop or, or some type of monitoring system of the program, and from that perspective, you're able to watch the program uh, be solved. So if you're waiting on a contact to be closed or something to take place, you can see it physically on the computer. You see where, like here, you see a highlighted contact. <laughs> excuse me, come on, and then uh, uh, when us, all these contacts are highlighted, at that point the output will turn on. When you're dealing with situations such as like those relays where you have series of relays tied in, um, that gets to be rather challenging because now you're not Ow. sure what you're waiting for. So that could be a problem as well. This is the uh, wiring diagram of a PLC. You'll see a series of inputs. Uh, this is what they'd call the input side, and this would be the output side. So you're looking at a series of contacts, and this particular case is showing us um, a series of limit switches. You close this, this contact, and the PLC will see this input turn on, and then you will see that go active in the, in the uh, PLC program. Likewise, on the outputs, if you, uh, the program is all the conditions are true and you turn on the output, you will see this, con this terminal here go high or, or possibly low, depending on whether it's wired to, to go high or low. And at that point, the output would turn on. Or 1.2 parts of the PLC. So here, yeah, what are we looking at here? So like I mentioned earlier, we do have a series of, of components here, uh, an input module, an output module, a CPU, and they, they, are, they threw in the power supply. Uh, depends on, again, when you're looking at um, a modular style PLC where it's got the multiple slots 
and um, multiple points of, of inputs and outputs, then you're looking at something more like this, like where you have the modular device, where you have a modular power supply, a CPU, and a series of input and output modules, possibly a communication module, maybe some different types of modules, an analog or in or analog out module, maybe even like a servo or uh, something of that nature as well. Um, here in this, uh, the, the first device we looked at was actually uh, the, the fixed I.O. All this is in one nice neat little package. You can't separate them. And in the modular side, you can separate each one of these devices. So again, it's uh, what they consider to be an open architecture or design. Uh, so here they're basically stating that you're allowed, they, they, they give you the hardware and you're allowed to pretty much design the program to operate any way you see fit. Uh, where do you, when they have a closed architecture, or, uh, that simply means that then you really can't, uh, you can't set the system up the way you want. So, so from an, from that perspective, this uh, open architecture would be kind of like a modular system where you can you can adjust it and tweak it any way you want, adding inputs, outputs, that kind of thing. And a closed architecture would be something more like uh, the the fixed I/O or, or that, that little brick of, of I/O that uh, has a processor inputs and outputs all in one piece. So here we're looking at uh, some more fixed I.O. I mean this is uh, um, uh, comes all in one nice little package as you can see as we discussed a little bit uh, all the inputs all the outputs and then the CPU all in one package and here's a couple of different packages of that same thing. And then here's the modular style where you've got the power supply, the CPU, and the series of input and output modules. Here's what it kind of looks like in, in the field. Here's another piece of the same thing where they're illustrating the power supply, the CPU, and then a series of, input, series of inputs and output cards. As I mentioned earlier, that Slick 500, here's, a, here's an item that's been around for 30 years, still in, in operation in a lot of places. So this is something that, you know, you will see uh, from time to time out actually out in the field yet. And this was uh, a good solid 30 years old anyway. So my, my point being is that uh, that Slick, that the, the hardware for the PLC stuff sticks around a lot longer than that of a PC. So that's, that's a good reason to use it. how the PLC operates. So the first thing it does is it uh, goes out and it reads the inputs. It goes out and pulls all the information from all the input cards. Pulls that in and puts it onto a, what they call a data table. Next piece of that is that it runs the program. So it's running the, it runs the program. After it's read the inputs, it goes out and runs the program. From the program, it, it determines, uh, it, it updates uh, again the data table for the outputs. After the data table has been updated, the output data table has been updated, at that point, it sends that information to the output cards. And so it turns on and turns off all the necessarily, uh, necessary outputs uh, to operate the machine. And then the last piece of that is diagnosis and communication. So uh, it, uh, the, the PLC at that moment uh, goes through and uh, validates that the uh, systems operating correctly and uh, all the communications are passed out to all the proper places to let them the other processes know what's taking place again uh, the IO or input output system um, is uh, interface by which the field devices are connected so it just it's how the inputs and the outputs are tied to the CPU or how we get that information to the program. So through the input and output modules. And then here's the output module, very similar to the input module, only opposite direction. So where the inputs are taking information and bringing it to the PLC, the output module is taking information that it's generating or the program is generating and sending it out to the outputs. Uh, the typical monitoring device is going to be your laptop, 
Um, I know uh, some of the latest technologies, they're, they're getting into where they're using like uh, net pads or even like a cellular, cellular type format where you're, you've got a handheld device, you're monitoring the PLC program. So the technology is there. Um, it depends on, on where you're, you're, uh, the company you're working for at the time is at, but, uh, but a lot of companies at this moment are still using laptops, which is a solid way to, to interface to a PLC. To, to monitor how a program is operating. Here's kind of a screenshot of what a PLC program uh, entails. You can see here it's got uh, what they call rungs, which, which is where all the information is stored. So you've got a series of contacts and coils. The contacts are typically something coming from an input, and the coils are something going to an output. Once all these contacts have, have uh, uh, gone active, then this output turns on. So the way the PLC program reads is it goes from left to right. If I see continuity or, a, or this, this contact here highlighted and this contact here highlighted, the PLC will highlight this contact and turn on the appropriate output. Information here on the left is a lot of the configuration, whatnot, that kind of thing. So you can see here, you got uh, uh, processor status, configuration, uh, some different, more, some more configuration information. Uh, here is uh, the program file, so uh, different, uh, uh, the ladder programs. So this, as you can see here, you can have multiple ladder programs. So uh, all tied together, working together as, as one. And then there's some data files, some uh, some different um, components uh, that you're allowed to use in the PLC. So uh, we'll be getting into that here shortly. And then uh, some source files at the bottom. But uh, this is the basic layout of a PLC. So let's get into some of the nuts and bolts of, of how a program works in the PLC. So again, what we're just looking at is uh, the instructions in front of it to turn on a coil. Uh, these are rungs, and uh, this is considered a branch circuit here. Um, if you think of it as a, like a ladder, you've got the, the, the two components on the on left and right supporting the rungs in the middle. So if you think of it that way, that is um, a, a pretty solid way to look at it. Uh, in order for this contact to go higher or, or to turn on, I need to have this contact and this contact show highlighted in order for this to come on. So as you can stay, see here, this has a, a slash to it, meaning that it's normally closed. So what that means is that this normally open contact is looking for a signal to come on to close. And this particular signal here is looking for a signal from the input to turn off before it allows it to come on. And we'll be getting further into that here shortly. 1.3, principles of operation. So here we are. Um, so we got uh, an example here of a mixer process. Uh, so the mixer motor is to be used to automatically stir liquid in the vat when the temperature and pressure reach preset value. So basically what they're saying here is that when the inputs are all in the proper state, at that very moment, we will run the mixer operation. So here we got a pressure switch that has to close, a temperature switch that has to close, and at that very moment, we will close the motor starter. Well, they've got a manual override too, so being in parallel. So, so if this comes on, this comes on, this gotta come on. Or if I press the manual push button, it will come on immediately because there's, there's the power will flow to here, turning that motor on. Now they're showing us here in a PLC format how that same thing would work. So here we've got uh, a pressure switch tied to an input a temperature switch tied to an input, and a manual push button tied to an input. And we have one motor tied to an output. So we have in the program now, we've programmed a pressure switch, I1, which is this address here, I2, which is this address here, and I3, which is this address here. So when I make this contact and this contact, this comes on, or I press this button, this contact comes on, turning on the output. 
So uh, a couple of points they're making here is you gotta make sure that the PLC is in run mode. So what that means is that the, the PLC has a several, di several different modes of operation. We'll be getting into that shortly. But the, uh, essentially, the, in order for the PLC to, to turn on the real world outputs and to run the program, it has to be in run mode. Um, let's see here, the status, uh, it's checking the status of the inputs. And uh, okay, it's kind of going through some of the reviews of I1 and I2 are closed when I3 is closed. So, and or when I3 is closed, this output will turn on. And here's they're showing it actually in the PLC itself. So that's how they're working it. So this guy can come on, this guy, and this guy has to come on, or that guy can come on. Uh, so here they're just showing us how this would be wired in a fixed I.O. Uh, PLC controller. So we're looking at uh, some, another fixed, or uh, they call these bricks because they're just one block where the CPU inputs and outputs are all tied together. Modifying the operation. So, um, so let's say we need to change the operation a little bit. So now they've flip-flopped, so now the pressure switch and the temperature switch, um, uh, both of these guys have, still have to be on, but the way they made it now is instead of both those guys or the manual push button, now they put it in the center here. So they moved it from this point to this point. So now what that means for us is that if we were wiring this, for instance, we would have to go into the uh, control box actually take a wire off a terminal, find find the correct wire, and move it to this location. And um, to make sure we did it right and all this, it'd be a, it'd be a few steps. So in a PLC program, it's just a matter of moving this contact from this location to this location, and, and bam, you're in business. There's no wiring acquired. Just like that. Pretty nice. Not so bad. It's a whole lot easier than pulling out your screwdriver. All right, as we I mentioned before, computers versus PLCs. Uh, so the architect's base is, you know, it's still the same processor, same CPU. Typically, um, from uh, what I've been exposed to, it looks uh, typically they'll take a, a uh, computer's uh, CPU unit and uh, transfer it to a PLC after about five or six years, something of that nature. So usually the PLC world's usually five or six years behind the PC world when it comes to the latest and greatest technology. Um, some manufacturers are, are more up to date than others, but uh, I want to say the, they don't they don't want to be cutting edge on the PLC sides of things because things change so fast at cutting edge that uh, they become outdated in the same time before they even get them to production. So they like to make sure a lot of that, uh, that those software and hardware issues are vetted very well before they, uh, they, they create a new platform around it. So again, uh, some of the aspects about it is uh, the ladder logic is the primary programming uh, format in a PLC. Um, usually, uh, uh, most industries are following the uh, the ladder. Um, there are, we will be discussing this soon, uh, multiple different ways to program a PLC. There's more than one uh, one language, but the uh, majority of everyone's using the uh, uh, ladder at this point. Uh, 
so again, uh, here we are. We're kind of reviewing this. Um, they they took out the uh, um, the one step of diagnostics and communications. Um, when you when a lot of people talk PLCs, this is a lot of their process of thinking is uh, monitor inputs, execute the program, and change the outputs. Um, this is this is very common. This is this is the, the typical. Um, not everybody includes diagnostics and communications, but just just know that it's there. But uh, this is acceptable, and most 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 everyone that you talk with will would follow this this, this format here just fine. Um, some of the aspects that you uh, you'll run into in the PLC world is uh, like for instance the CPU. You have uh, a couple of lights to work with. Um, this is a little bit old technology, um, the, the the display here, but uh, you get the idea. You get a, a if it's in run mode, run mode light it would be on, of course. And then if it was faulted, you get a fault light. And if there's a battery problem, they would give you a, a light on the battery. Batteries. Uh, I should bring that up real quick. Uh, the battery behind the purpose behind the battery is um, in the older technology, um, they didn't have all the flash RAM and all that that they have nowadays. So they have actually what they call a battery backup. So what will happen is if you turn the power off to your PLC, you don't want to lose all your programming and all that information that you've got stored in there. So what they do is put a battery backup in there. So that supports, maintains all that memory, keeps all that information fresh. So when you power back up, everything powers back up and, and starts right where it left off. Keeps things pretty efficient. Um, again, some of the uh, the software packages that we're going to be uh, learning is the RS Logics and uh, RS Links. Um, there's two pieces to that. Uh, the Allen Bradley software uses this RS Links uh, to develop a uh, communication link between your laptop and the PLC. Um, Alan Bradley, I think, is one of the only ones that has two separate software packages for that, um, and we we are a strong Alan Bradley school, so that's what we, we focus a lot of our hardware is on Alan Bradley world. So that is uh, part of it. Uh, RS Logics is the old version of the software. We actually use RS Logics 5000 now, um, and uh, we are. The, the class is actually shifting more and more to 5,000. So you'll, you'll be seeing uh, uh, a whole lot less of the 500, which is the RS Logic, uh, older technology. And we will be doing all of our labs and, and lectures and whatnot about the RS Logic 5,000. So that's uh, kind of the older technology. As I mentioned, it's about 30 years old now. They do have what they call a HMI software. Um, Alan Bradley makes it. There's actually multiple manufacturers of it. Um, it is uh, uh, an interface to the PLC for operators. And uh, as you can see here, it gives you a graphic display of, of what uh, what's going on in the real world. And uh, you're able to monitor and uh, control things with a graphic display like such as this. To help you understand what you're actually controlling, or when there's a problem, maybe point you to the right location. So it's a huge help. Uh, you hear them called HMIs, um, which is uh, 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 Human Machine Interface, uh, you, uh, MMI, Man Machine Interface, uh, Touch Screens. There's a lot of different uh, nicknames for them, but um, I, typically I'll, I'll, I'll refer to them as. Uh, Touch screens. Um, here's a, uh, a newer version of a PLC. They call it the, the, the PAC. Uh, this is a, a, a GE version of the same thing. Uh, there's, like I said, there's lots of different manufacturers out there. So this is just uh, just one of many. Uh, size and application. So uh, again, here you're looking at some different sizes. Uh, your look, most majority of your sizing of your PLCs are going to be based off from um, the number of I/O required. So, what they do as a manufacturing uh, of PLCs is 
they take the number of I.O. that are used and they size the amount of memory required for that I.O. So what, what that means for us is essentially if we have, if we undersize our PLC, say we, uh, we size our PLC to handle 10 points of I.O., and uh, a year later, the, uh, the machine goes from 10 points to, to 50 points. Um, now all of a sudden we got to come up with a whole bunch more I.O. on this machine. And when we add, a, if we were to add just I.O. to it, we'd probably start coming up short on the memory. So what we like to do is we like to make sure we oversize our PLCs. We have room for plenty of spares which also gives us plenty of room for, for additional memory in, in the case that we need, to, we need additional memory. So here we are, we're looking at a, uh, a PLC controlling a system uh, with an operator interface, something very, very simple though, that you'd be uh, uh, very simple controlling one process. So here's another application of multitask. PLC application involves one PLC controlling several processes. So what you could have is one PLC controlling the, uh, the uh, engine block assembly, uh, or, or, or machining, excuse me. And then you would have the assembly line where they're building it all together. And then they also check it at the end to make sure that all the parts are in place. So this is very common, not um, uh, nothing, uh, nothing out of the ordinary for most industry. As you can see here, as we, we, I think we actually saw a video of this, a picture of this earlier. What they do is they tie everything together. See, this is this is because there's one Ethernet switch. You got multiple PLCs tied to it, and this information is getting all passed up to um, management and whatnot of the uh, manufacturer you're working for, and that way they can they can monitor uh, production output. They can they can monitor faults. They can monitor. Um, what's going on with equipment, uptime, downtime, and um, uh, throughput. So it's a, it's a very common problem, pro, uh, process now. Um, the, the idea of controls in IT being two separate entities is getting pushed into one. So, uh, so for those of you that are really strong in the PC world and are struggling to, to find your niche in the PLC world, um, uh, keep in mind that uh, the, the the two worlds are, are, are coming together very very rapidly, and you're going to see uh, a less of a border. There, there uh, it's going to be uh, transparent. There will not really be a border between the two. So as you can see here, some memory sizes and whatnot. They got uh, uh, everything is. Uh, based off of uh, the, the binary value. So when you say like, for instance, 1K of memory, it's 1024. Uh, it's just based off 16 bits. That's all this is really stating here. So there's some different uh, controller memory applications here that's available. I, I think these are outdated. I think these numbers are I don't think you can even find one that's at 1K anymore. You won't find anything, anything less than 32 meg, I don't think. Um, some of the terms that Alan Bradley uses. These are terms to know. Um, XIC and XIO. This is a very common thing. Uh, XIC means examine if closed. So what that means is it's a normally open contact. You're not looking at it. The, the PLC is not acknowledging that uh, contact as passing power until there's power to that input or uh, examined if closed. So when you hit power to the input, it's assumed that that contact is making continuity from this point to this point. Examine if open, XIO. As you can see, it's got a line through it. So that means if the input is off at that point, you will receive power from this point to this point. If the input turns on, you will that will open up and you will no longer have power to it. So when you see the bit status, they're talking the input status or the bit status of that. So, so then here's some of the points of that. 
Um, OTE, Output Energize. Um, this is the output coil. If, if you remember uh, when we were looking at previously, we had a, 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 a rung that looked uh, something, uh, let's see here if I can draw that up. Uh, from here. Something that looks something like that. That would be an OTE. And then uh, output latch and unlatch. I don't want to discuss those too much. These two components here are, are what I call to be uh, uh, something that is available in a PLC, but we don't use them. They're, they're not a, um, they're, 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 they have a certain purpose, but uh, not, not for our class and, and not for most programming applications. We will be getting into timer offs, timer ons, counters, downs, and counter offs here in, in, uh, in future chapters and, and future units here.